linear algebra is the study of linear transformations. Most of the linear algebra books start with a bunch of matrix algebra. In every other dimension, the, the act of taking derivative is basically a search for a linear function that approximates a nonlinear thing. Hello children, I hope you are doing beautiful mathematics. In this video, we will talk about linear algebra. In particular, I will speak to high school students, to middle school students, and maybe to early undergraduates. I'll share with you why I love this subject and why should you actually care about it. I'll also talk about two different books. Two books that takes two different perspective on the same subject. I love both of them, by the way. So let's start with the basics of linear algebra. What is it? What is this subject all about? Well, in a nutshell, linear algebra is the study of linear transformations. What is a linear transformation? The word transformation sounds very mysterious. Well, linear transformation is very simple. It's a map. It's a function. Okay, what kind of function? Well, every function has a domain and a codomain. For the sake of our video, for the sake of this example, let's think about the domain and codomain both to be R2, that is the XY coordinate plane. So, okay, so these are functions from R2 to R2. So they take input elements from R2 and they give output elements in R2. Fantastic. What else? What makes them linear? Well, the simplest definition is this, that if you add two points, you can coordinate-wise add, right? 2, 3 and 4, 5, you can add them. So if you do, if you apply the function before adding the coordinates, whatever you will get, you can separately apply the function to each of the coordinates and add. You'll get the same thing. I'll give you a non-example. The square function is not linear. It's a function from R to R, not R2 to R2. I'm coming in one dimension down from R to R. Let's see why the square function is not linear. Say, if I take the square of 2 and 3, 2 plus 3, is it equal to 2 squared plus 3 squared? Can I do the squaring separately and then add and get the same thing. I can't, right? 2 plus 3 whole square is 5 square, which is 25. 2 square is 4, 3 square is 9, so that's 13. So squaring, the act of squaring is not linear. A linear function allows this to happen. Let the linear function be f, then f of the point A plus point B is equal to f of a plus f of b. That is like the simplest way of thinking about linear functions. There are deep connections of linear functions with something called group homomorphisms, which we can, you know, talk about in a separate video when we talk about group theory. I love group theory, by the way. But let's come back to this. Why should we be so worried about linear functions? They seem very simple. Well, there are multitudes of use of linear functions. One of them, most of you know, even if you're in school. Uh, you've learned calculus, right? Even if you have not, maybe you've heard about calculus. Derivatives, integrations, and so on and so forth, right? So, I, I, I show you the connection between calculus and linear algebra. It's a wonderful connection. I just now told you that the square function is not linear. The square function is not linear. And I explained why it is not linear. The whole point of differential calculus is to actually approximate a non-linear function 
by a linear function. Think about it one more time. You have a non-linear function, x square, and you have a linear function. You have a linear function, which is f of x equals to some constant times x, let's say. You want to approximate the behavior of the non-linear function by a linear function. You learn about tangents being drawn to a parabola. If you are, if you have done a little bit of calculus, you know this. That what you essentially do is you draw the parabola, which is a graph of a x square, and you draw a tangent to a particular point. The slope of the tangent is the derivative. But what sometimes people miss out is that the tangent itself is the linear approximation of the parabola at that point. This actually works in higher dimensions as well. I'll come, come to that in a second. But let's first think about this a little bit more closely. Let's look at fx equal to x square at x equals to 3. Then the value of the function at x equals to 3 is 9, right? So 3 squared is 9. So 3 comma 9 is the point on the function. Now what you want to do is that you want to have a straight line which has the same slope as the parabola at that particular point. That is that the equation of that line is your linear function. That is the linear approximation. So what is the slope of the parabola at that particular point? Well, if you take the uh, derivative of fx equal to x square, you will get fx equals to 2x. You multiply 2 with the input point 3. So the slope is 6. So the equation of the line is fx equals to 6x plus some constant. Now you can find the constant and you can tell me in the comment section. So what we just did is the one dimensional variant of what happens in every other dimension. In every other dimension, the, the act of taking derivative is basically a search for a linear function that approximates a non-linear thing. Why are we so excited about linear approximations? One big reason is this, that when they exist, and it's not all, they do not exist always, but when they exist, when the linear approximations exist, they can be hand computed or computed by a computer. Why? Because one of the things that you learn in linear algebra is that every linear function can be expressed as a matrix. That's why you read matrix algebra in high school. That's why you start with matrix algebra when you start with a basic linear algebra course. You start with matrices because a matrix represents a linear function. So now I think you can make some connection of what's happening. You have something non-linear. You want to approximate it with something linear. Why? Because that linear function can be represented by a matrix. And that matrix can be computed using a computer. So essentially... It's very hard to work with nonlinear stuff, but if you can have linear approximations, then you can use a computer to do most of your calculations, or at least approximate calculations. That's sort of the philosophy behind linear algebra. That's one way to look at it. And a very beautiful book, which, which does not start with matrices. This is very critical. That's, what I, that's why I love this book. Most of the linear algebra books start with a bunch of matrix algebra. Even before you understand why am I doing so much matrix multiplication and calculations. And by the time you understand, you know, oh, 
a matrix is representing a function in a particular basis for the vector spaces and so on. By the time you understand that, I mean, you have done a bunch of calculations with matrices and you did not necessarily understand why you did it. So this particular book by Sheldon Axler, uh, this book is really, really remarkable. It's called Linear Algebra Done Right. Indeed, it is done right. It's, it does not start with matrix algebra. It, it starts with the study of linear functions in a completely abstract sense. That's why I love this book because it sort of goes into the philosophy of linear algebra. On the other end of the spectrum, we have this book called uh, Just Algebra. It also has other things like it has, you know, um, group theory and other, other, other parts, fields and so on. But it also has linear algebra. And this book is by a very, very uh, interesting mathematician, Michael Ortin. Uh, so you, it, it, this is a very concise book. It has a, it's a very flavorful book. It is the first time you realize that when you take determinant of a matrix, you are actually in cross and matrix, suppose you're taking a determinant of it, you're actually searching for a function with certain properties from n square tuple. So n square. So if you have a three cross three matrix, you essentially have nine numbers, right? So when you are calculating a determinant, you are mapping from the nine dimensional space to a one dimensional space. Determinant is a single number. Output of the determinant is just one number. So uh, this, this book has this sort of flavors to it. It makes you think about regular uh, artifacts of uh, linear algebra in a very, you know, deep kind of way. So uh, that's one way to look at linear algebra. It is used as linear approximations of non-linear stuff. I'll give you another area where we recently used linear algebra. Uh, this was in a excursion in mathematics or math camp that we conducted. And there we constructed a neural network by hand. So even if you don't understand neural network, I'll just give you a little sort of overview of what it is. So essentially, the problem was like this, that if you have the age and the height of a particular child, what is the weight of that child? If you have age, if you have height, what is the weight? What is the weight, uh, uh, weight of the child? So you want to predict that. You want to predict the weight of the child given the age and the height. And the idea is this, that philosophically again, we, th we think that somehow we can combine the age and the height in some manner. We can combine that and produce the weight. Now, in an artificial neural network, the first thing we do in general is that we do a linear combination of these input things. So we multiply the age with some number which we call a weight. We multiply the height with some number which we also call a weight. And we add another number which is called a bias. So essentially, let's say the height is h and the weight is w. Uh, uh, height is h and the uh, age is um, a. The, and if the two weights are W1, W2 and the bias is B, then first you form the linear combination. W1 times H plus W2 times A plus B. Why do you do the linear combination? Because another way of thinking about it is that this is like the simplest thing that you could have done. And then you sort of inject some non-linearity into it which is a separate discussion we use an activation function and then you basically update the coefficients by just looking at the loss at every stage. But what I just wanted to, you know, communicate to you that even if you are learning about um, 
neural networks of machine learning, essentially, you have to know linear algebra and vector calculus. Vector calculus comes very heavily even in the early stages of neural network. So I just showed you two different sort of areas of mathematical sciences which heavily depend on linear algebra. One is calculus and one is neural networks um, and machine learning and so on. There are numerous other spaces where linear algebra is heavily, heavily used. So I hope you have some fair fun learning it and uh, solving some really good problems on it. And if you have any questions regarding this, you can also put it in the comment section. If you are in a research program at Chinta, these research programs are for school students, for undergraduates and for university students. Then if you are taking a pure mathematics research program, you might be doing some linear algebra already. You can use these two books, Axler or Artin or both, depends on your advisor. If you're also doing a project related to machine learning or deep learning, then also they may ask you to do linear algebra. So many school students at Chinta do awesome projects. Um, so I think you will also have some fun. Learn, learn really well and have some fun with it. All the best. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.